And as Jose said at the beginning, um, especially for discussion, if you put your back, like to come up a little bit, we're a small crew. We can actually have a real discussion, not just the people in the panel in front discussion. Small gradient in this direction. Okay. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. Appreciate <laughs> it. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm going to start out the the panel uh, discussion by asking the panelists some questions. But again, we're a small crew, so as you have ideas, feel free to come in with your own opinions and make it into a real discussion. And then if we get too sidetracked after a while, I'll restart somewhere else. We randomly start. See how long it is. Um, all right. Um, so the, the 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 question that I want to start out. Um, for today is um, or one question. So we, we looked at a lot of domains where um, uh, we were talking about how do we know if our, we're looking at offline data, right? Looking at bad data data. And how do we, uh, so there, there's some theoretical things you can say if you collect the data in the right way, but oftentimes we don't have choices over collecting our data. What, what are people's thoughts on what we can do with batch data that have just been created and uh, either in diagnosing whether it's good enough or um, providing suggestions to people in terms of how they could collect their batches more effectively. So there's a paper a long time ago that we had, which is talking about running from log implicit exploration data. And then the idea in that paper was that uh, sometimes people don't record the probability of the action, but they are actually exploring. And then what you can show is that so you have an unstationary policy implicitly which is doing the exploration. So what you can show is that um, if you look at the frequency of time that policy would choose an action in the context over all the different events, which is essentially equivalent to trying to estimate the probability that the action will be taken uh, given the features. And then uh, assuming that uh, estimate goes well, you can start plugging in this estimated probability into conventional data by running that right? And uh, so it's like a cross your fingers here because uh, the, the, does your estimate work out well? Um, but I think that's the best advice I have when uh, you don't actually have any kind of systematic data for probability. It's a point that's stationary. Uh, no, it can be non stationary. So like if you're running Lin UCD, which is a non-stationary policy that doesn't create explicit probability, it's actually there, sometimes there is no probability for Lin UCD because at the moment you're choosing the action, you're choosing deterministic. But uh, because the order, what it, it, it requires is the events in the world be kind of exchangeable. And then uh, it's this exchangeability in the world which it's going to define the probability of, of the action being taken. Our this year paper, we discuss this is one of the discussions of our paper, and you have observational data that's non causal. And then the question how can you kind of like leverage this data to start in a better place when you decide to do a real then you decide to, and then you kind of have the solution, the solution of the idea of a possible solution to that. And the uh, development behind it, you don't need to do the it can be completely offline. You just say, how can we improve the online? What is the trick? Uh, in, 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 some, in some way, you can, you can fill in some of the of the cells, but not all of them, using some some part of causal interact or causal And you can plot and show the bump, how can we improve it? Is, I, I forgot the title of the paper, but it's very, I think it's very good and observed confounders. And the challenge that we're trying to have, in some way, we're trying to you don't make the claim that you can use completely because you're concerned about the confounder that you said across your finger. You don't hope to be able to just make a little bit of A given the future of the apps. You kind of say, this in general is not possible. That's the, one of the pieces of the paper. 
So in general, it's not possible, but if, if there's implicit exploration in the data, then I think it is possible. <laughs> Ask a question. So when you said cross your finger, did you mean that maybe the, the data is not big enough to have accurate estimates, or did you mean that? Yeah, so you need to have an appropriate effective generalization. You need to be, be able to basically predict into the realizable setting in order to realize and succeed here. The problem is, yeah. so John, can I ask you a question? You're, you're talking mentioned there are cases where your policy determines something, but then the downstream act overrides it. Yeah. And does the same thing, right? Yeah. And let's say they didn't block that. That's in the case. It's not such a big uh, when you get some sort of downstream thing overriding, is that all the mathematics is still correct, it's just because you're wrong. So, so you, say, you, say, I want to do three. you say, I want to do action three, and the system says, no, we're going to do action one. And then you can faithfully estimate what would have happened if you chose any other policy uh, that would have been overwritten with action. Uh, one, right? You get an on estimate for what actually is. Yeah, so you, you get you get a correct policy estimate. It's just that it's not, uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's kind of insensitive to your choice of policy. Uh, that, that's question today. Are you saying that whatever controls, uh, well, not controls, but like virtually like really controls, uh, what is being sent to the user should be marked, right? Like, whatever you have a control over, you should be logging. Because it doesn't really matter that it's going to manifest itself to something else, because, well, this is what you control. The next time you do the same thing, the same thing is going to happen. So as yeah, long as that other part doesn't change, it's fine. I'm going to say yeah. a model of specification. So if the reason the system put action five instead of action three was because of some hidden variable, and when that variable changes, then they don't do action five, they do action six instead. Yeah, then, you then, you're, then you're certainly better off logging what the system actually did because that might give you some intuition. If you have kind of a specified model, it doesn't matter. So, so I think it's important to always realize that you're getting estimates of what would have happened in the past if you were using the model, not what will happen in the future. Right. Uh, right. So that's it's, you, you would like to know what will happen in the future, but you only know what would have happened in the past. But I guess I'm saying something that maybe a little bit stronger than that, which is if you do log what action was deployed, even if you have these unobserved confounders, you may be able to say something a little bit more. You may be able to. It, I think it's hard to, I don't know how to systematize that. So if you want to be, if you're, if you're logging at the point where you control, you systematically start making the right choice. Uh, but uh, there's, there's more you can do, I'm certain of that. Uh, but, uh, I think we can do system. We have a set in the same causality that is called the uh, instrumental variable. It is just a given incentive, the person may follow or not. <clears throat> if you are completely non parametric and you don't know if it's linear or so, you can bow. You cannot get a point. But if it's linear, you can back. You think a lot about this, but when you finally ask the question about how can you look at some back here and figure out how to. So when you go back online, it, it did make me think that um, basically a whole lot, a huge amount of economics and other social science is all about when you actually can't take action exactly, how do you find the body structure? So I know there's a, a huge literature out there. I've seen pieces of it, I'm not an expert in it, but Mike Rell um, mentioned instrumental variables. And there's also something called, for example, regression discontinuity, where if you look at people even in the two university, if they cut off score 75, then people are not, not 76, there's a 74, they're basically the same person. So I think there's a whole bag of tricks and economic tricks and so on that could be applied to data. If you have some ideas about how to structure that, then it pays you um, when you actually can start as well. In computer science as well, we are kind of talking about economics and try to tell what are the theory of six, as you call it, that you have to try to improve the daily data analysis. But then it's true, usually the, how they collect data. Kind of chaotic way, non control. Then they have, it's a classical problem in the field of, of knowledge, but they have observational data. 
under what conditions can you make the causal or experimental plan? In some sense, in general, we do have the capability to all these algorithms of flipping the coin or, or red light and do the experimentation. But uh, uh, the, the two problems, one is learn the causal graph, as I said, and there's a lot of people interested in that. And the other, economists usually they have a causal graph, or they call structure equation what? Equation models, SEM. But this is, there is a mapping. One to one from this to the causal graph. But still, there is the problem of how to estimate the magnitude of the fact. Because even when you have the qualitative assumptions in terms of this equation, it's still the confounding is so strong. Or the data can be so messed up that you are not unable to get the real signal. The things are too compounded. Then, we, what we studied has a few uh, the conditions that we can be called or we call identified. I mean, um, one thought I have is that's kind of what we could bring from economists to the statisticians, but in a way, actually, hopefully, in 10 years, a lot of them are out of the job, right? In the sense that it really hasn't been possible to randomize at this level. You know, until five years ago, psychologists, you know, 100, you, you had an advantage if you were to get your kid to to Stanford, because you could run 500 people a semester and start bigger than 100. So now, now all of a sudden, we can run things at scale. And um, I think I was with Susan Murphy and also um, uh, Bozan and I had a conversation that, you know, designing experiments is kind of trade off as a sort of field because most experiments were, you know, 100 subjects, 200 or certain issues. But I mean, now, the whole the world is kind of become valuable. So there are all these new questions now about well, how do we call these sequences of interventions? Are we doing it all just at random? Um, how do we actually call it them so we can exploit some online for the structure? Um, so I'm I'm really excited, even though I'm part of the sort of scientists, to see where basically we don't have to do these incredibly painful methodological things to squeeze and force the structure up. We can actually just experiment and then find out actually that the ways to experiment. This, this is um, the project. The, the one that I call my, my personal project is automated science. You can try to do that. But the challenge, this is a positive view. The challenge is that the in practice you cannot do experiments in many situations. Pascal one from four years ago smoking cancer. The kind of suspicions that smoking may be killing people. Then I cannot flip the coin, no ethical committee, and it's also not okay to do it despite the, the ethical committee in the universe, you will not allow that. Some cases is infeasible. I want to check the effect of cholesterol level in heart failure. I cannot have a dice with 100 levels of cholesterol, throw the dice, hope the patient to randomize the cholesterol. It's impossible. But still, we want to lose the effect of cholesterol. Then in many cases, you cannot, you cannot run the experiment. Right? Then the, the, the theory and understanding how to, to move into across regimes this is, another thing. This is also important. And this is the first one. The second one, uh, particular realization of my PhD, I studied this problem three years before, is a, a problem called external validity. Usually you conduct experiment in one setting, it could be in LA or in the mice, and you like to make the claim about the whole population. Even when you have the experiment, this happens with the FDA, they spend $50 million to conduct a perfect trial. Let's say they do not like the organization work, it didn't have no problems of compliance, that's what the CC is saying. And then you get the perfect estimate that we call internal validity. It works in LA or in mice. But under what conditions can you move to make the claim generalized to the humans or to the US? This is what I studied. It's meaning randomization is not perfect. We still need to understand how generalizable we can, we can make, like we can do how much the claim is generalizable or not. And this is what my work in the past. Yeah. So but I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. So if we shift a little bit from batch settings to now the online setting where we're actually able to, let's say we, we can do experiments. For those of you and, and yeah. on the panel and uh, elsewhere, for those of you who are working both on the theory side and on the apply side, actually running these experiments, where do you see the gap? Do you, can you run your theoretical algorithms and, and do they perform well? Or do you find that there are heuristics that you have to use that seem to work better and we're not sure why they work? It's certainly very common in the stuff that I've done to have bounds on, for example, how much exploration you need to do to guarantee good performance that are very, very wide. And so when you actually go to implement it, 
Well, when you answer gadgeting, you go and implement it, you find that the gadgeting is not sufficiently patient to use those bounds because that would involve like the lifetime of the universe and whatnot. So, so they tend to use other values, other heuristics like, yeah, well, you know, big enough. Um, and I, I feel like in, in some ways it's, in some ways it's the, the theory is a little, is, is, is a little bit uh, short of what you need it to be to apply directly to reality. Just to clarify, so you're using the same algorithm, but you just don't run it. Right. To the point yeah, so typically there'll be some kind of a parameter that says, you know, how certain do you need to be that one is above another to commit to it, or how many times do you need to try it before you're, you're confident? And we just, you know, ratchet them way down. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting line of research to make general but more specific assumptions where you can make tighter and tighter confidence bounds um, or other types of bounds so that the theory matches what you want to do in practice. You know, more, more uh, one example is, um, this is something that's very popular in reinforcement learning is they want to have complex predictors, they want to do model-free control, right? On the other hand, model free control takes a lot of data to train properly. And so how do you how do you combine model free and model based control for planning so that you have some huge assumptions about the, the environment you're working in, but you also want to be model free in some specific instances. How do you do that in a principled way? And if you can, you could train very well, provably using very few samples. Relative to. I've run into a problem which is more about computational complexity than depth complexity. Um, so, for the bootstrap explorer that I described earlier, it is a problem because you need to actually run a bunch of policies. Um, which, when you're looking at the time between when somebody clicks on the URL and sees a web page, um, might have some impact. Uh, so, you prefer to only be evaluating one, and then you need to set things up to do that. It's actually possible. Do it, but it involves more complex systems. You need to do the, the integration of our actions, uh, not on the critical path. Um, yeah, so that, that is one issue. The other issue that I think it comes up is when you're first deploying a system, you want to make it as easy to debug as possible. And then you end up doing stupid simple things because it's stupid and simple, and that will not be the bug. There'll be some other bugs you're going to find for the stupid and simple. And also just the issue of having atomic actions be problematic. That you some deployments and what's there and this notion that it's action A or action B and then we're gonna move to the next discrete time step. That doesn't work. Like we get this drug and this one we have to give, you know, a, a different time interval. This one is every two days, this one is every three days. How do you normalize time? I don't want to get into a whole SMP, semi MVP definition. Uh, so we make some first approximation in that model, and then we apply that to the right match. So we don't have the richness of explicitity that we want on the bench. Maybe I'm going to pause for because he's an MSR, but when I, you know, I, I run a lot of experiments in different online environments, and to me, the biggest barrier is actually being able to take a piece of technology. Everyone says it's really easy, but then, you know, when you try to run on Khan Academy or edX, actually getting randomization and having the data be available is a huge pain. When they do have it, they implement it simple easy testing where you can basically do randomized policy. Um, and so to me, maybe other people have more success, um, but even just trying to do the simplest down this algorithm that's adapted has been a big barrier. Um, and in fact, one thing that I've kind of been driven to do is actually come up with a method for actually implementing AB testing, I think, the right way. So if you take a piece of a website, um, what I now do in like online courses or send emails is take that technology component and set it up so that when you make the conversions, um, actually you can do AB testing, but um, you also get data about the reward, about the <coughs> characteristics, and then there's actually APIs to do the passing policies. So the, it's actually not that much more complicated than just doing testing in the first place. But basically I kind of set that up and because it just wasn't possible otherwise, where now um, you know if you've got a website and you start AB testing, you could actually send me, I can give you data in real time about someone landed, they got version one, is their age, did they click? 
And then you keep the NFT in your own time and after every step, you just pass it back to policy, just as a set of if then rules, kind of based on data what to do. And then you can send me one, you can send me international data. So for me, that's been a big barrier, um, but that's how I had to address it. And hopefully, I'm hoping that's something that could be useful to other people as well. But this period and the one that I mentioned earlier, I mean, just having a, a, a trusted system for points helps a lot in addressing this. Uh, so I think the question was like a simple exploration I don't get some here it's not being implemented yourself. The question is, are you absolutely sure that it's going to do what you think it should be doing? And uh, so there should be some you should be trying to use some library uh, that you trust rather than if you're doing it yourself, even if it's very easy to imagine doing it yourself. Just out of curiosity, what, what's the problem with it failing? Is it that the economic system breaking or just the APD less reliable for analysis? Um, like if, if I, if, if I'm worried said, about everything. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. You don't want to have safe faults, that'd be very bad. You don't want to have any kind of misreporting probability, that'd be very bad. Uh, uh, well, I, okay, I guess because maybe, I mean, it's like any kind of crash system, that's it, they're never going to let you know again. Yeah. But I guess for me, one thing I really like about problems like thousands, I want to sound like, you know, it's basically sure the problem was just to point to the third point one five. As long as its actions are all being taken randomly, that's actually totally fine. Or it's largely fine. It's not perfect, but you did select randomly, so you were running experiments. So maybe, you know, you told me it was in 10%, 20%, 70, and actually it was 30, 20, whatever. But I can still analyze that data. So you're gonna get a biased estimate. Yeah, so there's, 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 there's two cases. There's the realizable case where some regressor can predict the real world, you box and pops are wrong. And in that case, if your probabilities are wrong, maybe that's it's okay, at least as far as the computation goes. But if you want to do any kind of offline evaluation, then uh, the bias is going to be But if you log it incorrectly, that's that was the, yeah. So if you log it incorrectly, then you want to do offline evaluation, just goes. So often you're trying to get something which is like a 10% improvement. And if you have a bias of 10% and you're probably estimates, then, you know. <laughs> yeah, there, is, like, a, there seems to be an interesting trade-off there that <clears throat> do you want to explore to collect a better offline evaluation data set or do you want to explore to do functional optimization or revenue decision? I'm not sure that ever comes up. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, what the solution, what do people focus on in terms of solution, right? People seem to, it sort of seems to be like, we have this data set from offline off policy uh, exploration, we're going to use it for evaluation, and we're going to train it. Do people ever have, do people ever really try algorithms where they do two tiers of exploration, right? They're trying to do rep minimization, let's say, and they're also trying to build a large data set for off policy evaluation so that future uh, rep minimization problems can be done more efficiently. Or more reliably offline. Um, yes. Is that is that the yeah? yeah. yeah. Like is anytime it, you have an online working system, yeah. you're also collecting data for any kind of offline evaluation. Right? So you can then try to figure out how to minimize your regret even further with the offline evaluation. But presumably, if you just want to find the one best policy right now, you can do less exploration than if you want to be able to do offline policy over the space of all policy, That's in which case you need general exploration. So you need a specific. Yeah, so I think in general that. you want to be over exploring a little bit and under exploring a little bit. It depends what, what you're willing to assume about how you're going to use it. Yeah. And then you have to, you have to spend it. Yeah. So this morning we saw. You know, two talks where we learn that people do strange things, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but but that maybe is the feature of this area, right? Like if we had a model, um, as as Michael pointed out, you know, if you if you just had a video that was providing a reward signal in a really consistent fashion to your um, to your agent, then the agent could just apply reinforcement learning, and the problem would have been easy, right? So what makes the problem hard is that you are working with, you know, that there is. People that you can't necessarily model well in an interactive system. Um, so I, that is both a feature, but it also is a barrier for people who are maybe trying to do research in this 
there. So what are what are thoughts on how can how can people do credible research with interactive systems if they don't have a system set up in terms of systems that they could use or maybe alternatives of you know offline evaluation is one. But are there other alternatives to um, how people can be researching this area? I think there's one other alternative, which is uh, fairly credible. There's a lot of supervised learning problems where you need to predict something complex, and then something complex has some loss associated with it. So think about things like uh, machine translation, for example, or, or similar like defense approaches, right? So you can imagine, you can treat the dependency person problem as a simulator for uh, for some setting where you want to do exploration. And you, but by just saying, oh, I'm only going to any individual example of a sentence where I want to do a dependency parse, I only get feedback for one parse. Right? So it's, it's like you, you roll out. Or if you don't want to do a full reinforcement link, then you could, you could just do this for multi-class or custom to multi-class. These, these kinds of problems where um, it's, it, it, it seems like that's fairly credible. And the nature of the problem, there's not a lot of natural variation in those problems. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously some need to generalize and get to the real time supervisor. So I know people in HCI have done some incredible experiments on mechanical the turf. They've done, so you could do this thing on mechanical the turf where you could just pay people to be on retainer, $5 an hour, and they're just off doing their own thing, and then they get a paying on mechanical turf when they're supposed to do something, right? And so that is basically like a continuous user. Admittedly, not cheap, but there are cases where that is the right, the right uh, thing to invest in. And so I think, for me personally, I've done short-term user studies, long-term user studies. Uh, I've partnered with uh, various HCI people and information people that have an existing system, like let's say archive search. And then I've also interned with various tech companies. And I think there is a range. And so um, I think that if you get creative, mechanical search can offer a lot of interesting ways of doing setting up experiment design that maybe is not immediately obvious. Uh, plus one is common. In a way, um, I mean, in a way, mechanical search is basically if you could just get a bunch of random people, I mean, and do stuff for you. You know, like if I have an experiment run, I, I would love all of you to sit down and do it right now. But you won't, because right now, the <coughs> time, mechanical turf, you get them from everything. You know? And mechanical turf is kind of just the beginning. You know, you Google, there's ODS, there's um, digital assistance services. You can definitely, there are lots of people who are to do stuff with them. So, so those, for those who are so Yeah. I was just going to say, for those who teach classes, you can run the user studies now, you can do the online forums, or your classes. But, yeah. Not even this level. Can you even, call it? even recruiting students from your own class? Yeah. 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 I already has very specialized guidelines uh, regarding students for experience. Right, of course, of course. Yeah. But I would, I would add that uh, this, the issue of, you know, Maybe not reliable users in the market. But basically, we use these are all issues that has been funded. Psychology is for many years, that's actually very common. Where they got their participants. So it's it's not a it's not the end of the world. Like just talk to your um, psychology colleagues and figure out how they recruit their subjects, how they can go for it, and so on and so forth. Like one thing I learned is uh, basically if you cannot trust the quality of your subject pool, just make sure they are equally bad. Right? And then you give them different conditions, you can still make meaningful comparisons. Another thing I learned is if you have to recruit in a university setting, like you recruit students into your uh, practice to uh, determine when in the semester you recruit has a big difference. Like, People who would join the study early on in the semester are like people who either really get something done, they're usually of higher quality than people who really do it at the end of the semester. <laughs> 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 I, I, it's 
great to actually a, say that um, there's, you know, part of my PhD was focusing on the site. Um, it kind of raised me to more general question. I'm, I'm wondering, in current research or in future research, what role are different kinds of behavioral scientists play? Because, you know, when we're applying machine learning to different kinds of physical systems or, and, you know, electrical engineering, I assume there's some problem doing scientists. But if we're trying to optimize functions of users, right? Like where there's a bunch of different variables inside the user's head and we're trying to optimize their learning behaviors or decision making. How can we, how should we be involving particular domain scientists? And is it like psychologists or economists or sociologists or, or who gets thrown in there? Yeah, so I guess maybe, I'm not sure to what extent is MSR like the machine learning people with someone who's a domain scientist on a particular topic? Or I'm just trying to imagine in ways that we have sort of started doing this experimentation inside of platforms. Uh, I think. Often you want somebody who they're doing to be setting up the experiments because otherwise, or worse. Oh, sorry, when you say somebody knows what you're talking like someone so, who's so some sort of domain expert. expert. Okay, I guess maybe I just draw this thinking just because as a half behavioral scientist, half computational. Um, one thing I you could you could think of like a domain expert as being the person who builds websites that look good. That's an HCI person. But to some extent, the domain expert will also be, you know, an experiment psychologist who knows about decision making. Or is it someone who knows about learning? And in general, like, I just found that there's a lot of hungry potential there um, in the sense that, in some ways, a PhD in psychology, actually, you can almost throw away what you study. It's a PhD in experiment design. And I've actually been shocked talking to, you know, HCI collaborators or other areas that there's all this implicit knowledge that basically got found into a PhD. How to construct comparisons, um, how to how to instrument variables, and so on. That uh, I found really useful. Um, and I think it's the main problem is probably a lot of psychologists just can't speak the kind of computational language that scientists would. But one way uh, I can imagine being really helpful is I think you mentioned now that we can randomize all over the place. You know, there's some things we can't intervene on. You know, tough luck. But the external learning question really comes up, and I think. That also, that issue of external validity, I'm not sure if it kind of underlies a good finality is about when you have a theory and you're actually trying to apply it, what's different about the application? What did your theory abstract out? And one area where I can imagine being able to scientists like experiment psychologists being useful is actually basically figuring out how do we align those different tasks. So, you know, if I'm running studying M2, is it just invalid because I'm not using real students? You know, when is it that I can basically do a study of some behavior and I have to do it in the actual system itself? You know, like if I want to study people are going to buy products on Amazon, do I have to invent Amazon? Or can I actually do it with some kind of close version? And I think that's just an area of behavioral science could be useful in terms of figuring out what variables to measure and what we've done in a slightly different way. So I can propose more questions, but if there are questions in the audience, or the panelists want to ask each other. So about 20 more minutes, 15 minutes. I had a question. It seems like, or maybe it's also for the organizers. One area that is admittedly really hard to model is this sort of mixed initiative systems, right? So a lot of the system, things that we talk about here are sort of system-driven exploration or strategy taking. There's also user-driven, where you wait for the user to do something and you respond. There's also mixed initiative. I was wondering, just probably if people have thought about that in a more formal way or systematized way. It's sort of something that's been on my mind on and off. Here. So, a great question. Uh, we have been thinking a great deal about that. We not talk too much just yet. And I want to point out there is a paper by Exclusively with the mixed initiative of uh, This is research for that type of problems. The argument is there is a good combination of those. And the argument is, like as I uh, was saying earlier on, like, we don't want just human initiative because humans can be someone in a really powerful way. We want them to have people that we can do that. That could come from uh, all of our standard machine learning algorithms. But all of our machine learning algorithms are self optimal if we consider this in fact that we should set records. The human really is knowledgeable. We should be able to point the system to the solution rather than wait for it 
system to explore that power you want to pack in that you want to It's called mixed initial active learning. But it's like mixed initial active learning. Well, I think it makes you wonder about is maybe you're just talking about the interaction, but does that introduce issues with biasing the kind of data? Because it's going to be a lot harder to draw positive conclusions when you're basically responding to an action that's initiated, initiated by users themselves. Um, like to be concrete, if someone basically asks for help and then you take some actions in response, it's then a lot harder to tease apart. Did you help them succeed because they were just, um, you know, almost there and they asked for help and, put, and then you pushed them to the edge, or was your action actually really that good? Or if you do an action and it fails totally. Is that because the action is not useful because people only ask for help when they just look at us? I don't understand why that isn't just solved by existing offline evaluation techniques. And so if you if you explore over different possible ways of responding mm -hmm. to the help, then you can find a policy for giving help which optimizes for whatever performance criteria you care about. Well, I guess I was thinking that the question being asked was on if someone asks for help, then what's the best way to help them? I think it would be right. That's fine. What I kind of took to Yusuf's question was um, how do we start to draw conclusions from data that's gathered in mixed initiative systems? Where it's not just that I'm always competing on the world as a system. My actions are, are very dependent on what the user does as well. I think there's like it's useful to think of mixed initiative as something that provides a much wider, let's call it meta action space than what we are talking about action space. Here, right? it, it could be like a user would say, hey, in this state, the system you really want to take action. Like that's from a direct agency. Yeah. So it goes beyond just uh, like the, the <coughs> action space. There is one. Field that is start one area that people start to study in the last I think, two years or in the causal part of that, I don't work with that. It's called interference. It is when the action of someone knew what type or the work of someone what type of dog. And then you can find what kind of richer models in order to kind of disentangle exactly which pieces for each part. But this is in the causal sense. But I think people in social networks they have their own version that can be yeah. The models are much more complex. And the question for us in machine learning in general is like, do you have the capability of doing this kind of model? The people in these other things like psychology or so, they are kind of put together PhD because they are able to build some model that supposedly represent reality. Right? Just, yeah. We are in a situation that sometimes we try to make a box, right? a black box, that to, to replace whatever model they are doing. And I think the nice thing is to try to understand the trade-offs, right? Because we do magic in some way, but I think we can help, but we don't look for completely magical solution. And the second note to also be not doing something perfect, right? Because we have all these problems with replications and why in most ways the recent nature, one or two years of new nature paper, why why most of these studies are false? And they are following supposedly all these protocols of experimental design. Maybe the question is about what's going on, right? Then, the best possible work effort, and it's not that possible. It's still stuff. But I think our obligation, or we need to just try to learn and start understanding the trade offs. Right? Okay, so how many people here are familiar with each conference? Or um, how, how many people have been to CSU of your guide? I, I just say this because a lot of these questions, each one is human computation, um, and also a lot of research shows up a client CS. I mean, it just seemed like those mm -hmm. might be interesting kind of audiences to draw on and thinking of these issues of the interaction between users and algorithms. Um, they really focus on questions like, what can you get done with human computation instead of just using an algorithm? And I have this sense that it doesn't permit that much of this yet. Maybe there is a new field of uh, machine.
maybe if I can ask a kind of closing question, what do people think or do you think are these sort of most important next directions for basically being able to do machine learning in the real world, in, in these kind of everyday user technologies? Or what do you think is a good direction for the kinds of things that we've done to What would we love to see happen next? I don't know my answer. Uh -huh. Well, in real sense, my answer to it. <laughs> I think we should do what I said at the end of my talk. We should create these services which automatically support um, learning from experimentation and exploration. And getting that working well um, can have a fantastic world. And where does that seem to publish data? In data, it has to be make data. Yeah, that's going to be tough. I mean, any time the data involves people, so I know, but still, I think it's really very hard. It's one, um, you know, one area. I, I don't know if they're problems with industry, especially because Microsoft, Google, Facebook will get sued left and right, but um, like in, even in educational settings, so the Presenter mm -hmm. today may have none. Um, did it actually is you click a button on this website and you get three years of student data. But once you take names away, you don't really you can't identify someone by like which mark form they clicked on the response they gave. Um, I mean maybe you guys can, but you have to be pretty good. So I mean it actually might be the settings like mobile help, um, well, except then you have uh, all kinds of technical rules, but settings like educational settings might actually be a case where I think there's already data published and mm -hmm. There, I think people could easily show and to make it more available. So assistance.org, that's one site. Um, I'm also proud of email and they've got a huge learning science center. There's something called data shop. So you go to data shop, Google data shop, and you can basically download data sets. They're pretty well instrumented in terms of students interacting with uh, a tutor, uh, an automatic tutor. And they recently got an NSF grant to make something called LearnSphere, where they've got to combine loop data with Teaching data and other things, and I think that actually might get really the, the thing to be cautious about here is that there's uh, a group of PhDs uh, around security campuses who consider it their job to figure out how to do joint attacks in order to be on mice. Uh -huh. uh, they're pretty good. Uh, well, the, those white knights would be great for them to start taking a look at this data. <laughs> it's just, I mean, when you see this data, like. The trouble is, they don't look at it until it's public. Remember, it's public. You're already on the hook uh -huh. uh, to figure out how to break it. And it's good for them to do like it. Yes. The, thing is, the exactly. problem is even bigger than that because you might have this pages right now, but it's not going to be that cool. It's fun. If your baby is public, it can be there for the time of the And then you need other people who come later, right? So it's like, whether they, you know, the exposure to that. So I know that I'm talking to the things that I just suggested, but it might be based around it. I think it would be very good for uh, yeah, so, um, my, my feeling is that for many of these privacy issues, there's actually a better solution in asking the user to make the data public. So you can ask the user, and I think the right data use agreements also, so there's a pretty famous data set in the medical field, the MIMIT data set, which is a tons of IC data, and they've got everything, notes, um, signals, waveforms, and basically, when you download, you can download it onto your laptop. But, um, but when you when you when you request the data set, you have to say that I am not going to try to re-identify the data. And so at least, I mean, you could say that in some senses, if they do it, then the damage is already done. But at least you, you know they, they you you know that you can point a finger at someone and say that you, you shouldn't. Have done. This request was super powerful. I have signed a waiver. Fox, the researcher, has to click a button that I did not need to. That's the, exactly that's what you have to do for it. I mean, that simple layout, and there's a website if you look into this that allows us the simple layout, it's on your website and someone downloads versus you click to request it. I think that adds a whole new level because most people just don't care about random data enough that it's going to end up on the internet like targeted right? Mm -hmm. It's from the scientists who go in and look. And I think it's a lot harder for data to go throughout the public there. I mean, it's, it's essentially accessible. You just click a button, and then they they see that you're not afraid. They see you, you have an email address that's not a spam, and they send it to you. Um, that actually, I think, adds a huge amount of uh, protection that just putting data publicly available in a repository, like archive or something like that.
Oh, no, my job is aligned to that kind of security. My work is that, yeah, independently of these issues, uh, if someone is generating data, just tell how it was generated. Because all the problems that we discussed before relies on like, how the randomization was not randomized. In the same data set, with the same numbers, a completely different behavior we have. We can use the key for us, we use the data. So don't be like that. Thank you, sir. To ensure data integrity, potential privacy, and I'll be there for this next week. That noise in the data, you can publish it. That's a solution. Doesn't seem to be a very good solution. I think they're less of a What's that? They suggest that you add noise. You can add noise different ways so that they're designing more precision ways to add noise, but you're adding noise, and obviously, you're going to decrease the amount of signal that you have. It's, and, like, it's a trade off, I guess. I mean, so maybe that's not the exact thing, but it seems to the problems of the mechanisms to say, you know, we yeah. care about the anonymization of the base type that's not allowed, but we don't care about, about it that much. So we can add so enough noise such that. So the, the ad noise approach is what Netflix did. There was not a Netflix two challenge. Uh, there's a different strategy which may be useful in the future. Maybe this could be useful now, which is just uh, you don't inter I mean you only interact with some sort of uh, small piece of data set, and then you upload your algorithm to a computer which is boxed so that it runs there. Uh, and that, that could be effective in those things. So going back, I want to make one comment. Going back to the other questions, I want to pose a blank challenge to people in this group, which is since we all work somehow with freedom, and we map free humans as you know, just knowing the data generators, but they are intelligent beings. My point is, I'm not satisfied with any of the existing machine learning systems because I have proof of concept that if you treat them in nicely, they can really give you good information, right? So the challenge here is the following. Can we design a provable, provable theor theoretically provable system that will definitely be um, better than any machine learning system? Hybrid. It's in shape of the Whatever cost measure we want to use, number of interactions, time. Awesome. So, on that note, um, that's a great note to end with because it's a great challenge. Two announcements. Um, first of all, I was asked to announce that a uh, banquet will start at 7 p.m. tonight. So, we have about half an hour. Um, and also, uh, want to thank uh, all our speakers, all of you for coming. And I think Joseph deserves a, a special round of applause because did all the work organizing this. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say thanks so much, everyone. I had a great, great time up just as a Devon's so I'll be Yeah, I think we should also thank the organizers on my yeah. Yeah.
Sorry, man, I just closed this. <laughs> I think